like to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 as it's being read. If you'd like to follow along word for word, just use your pew Bibles. Philippians 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Have you ever met a Christian that you had a hard time getting along with? Of course you never. Well, that's the reality, isn't it, sometimes? We do meet even real Christians. For some reason, we just, you know what I mean. Paul has written so many wonderful things, even from prison, about the church at Philippi. Uh, this was a letter of tenderness, love, affection, joy. But it seems like there's always a fly in the ointment. Always something there that you wish wasn't there. And two ladies, to be precise, as was read just a moment ago. Yerodia and Syntyche. These ladies could not live in harmony together. These ladies could not agree. These ladies could not get along with one another. And it was so apparent that it came to the attention of the Apostle Paul. And he had to ask this person, true companion, who we don't know who really is, to help these ladies. Sometimes you need someone from the outside to come in to help. Now, having different points of view and having disagreements are not unusual for congregations. One writes these words a couple of years ago, a rapidly growing congregation. I know very well, sent out a questionnaire and asked its members to fill it out. And they sent it back, and they were trying to find out what people felt about certain things. More than 200 members did it, and they compiled these results. The one thing that the survey revealed most dramatically was that it was a very diverse congregation. For instance, some thought they ought to go to the bank and borrow money all the way and buy buildings and the land they needed. <clears throat> Others felt they should not borrow at all. Still, they ought to wait and not build until they could pay for it. Some felt uh, they were giving too much to missions. Others felt they needed to keep the money for themselves and use it to pay eventually for new buildings, save it up. Others said we should give more. The preach, a pastor should preach more in stewardship. There was a wide diversity. It doesn't surprise us because in the congregations there, there seems to be opinions on just about everything. But the question is, what do we do with this diversity? Do we allow it to cripple us? Do you say, well, we're so diverse we'll never agree, so we're not going to do anything? No, you move forward prayerfully realizing that some will disagree whatever costs you take. And the Bible does give us some guidance on this. Now, we don't know exactly what the disagreement was between these two ladies. We, we wish we did, but we didn't. And yet the Holy Spirit wanted us to know this much. One writes also, I'm curious about Yerodia in Syntyche. Uh, you've heard before, almost to the point where you don't want to hear it again, but some didn't. Some have renamed them Yerodias and Syntyche. And apparently, these ladies were that. And he says, I'd love to know what they were fighting about. 
and whether they ever resolve their conflict. But based on a lifetime in the church, he says, my guess is they were fighting about probably petty things, unimportant things. He says, why? Because that's our history. It's my observation that most conflicts that break out in a church are usually about something trivial, like the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. Uh, by the way, we didn't, I remember when we put this carpet in, that went okay, so we were blessed. Uh, like who gets to be the next president of the Christian Women's Fellowship? Or like who gets to, to know where to find the key for the silver uh, uh, church silver cabinet? Or who gets the wood from the tree chopped down in the church yard? Or like who gets to drive the church van? Uh, or whether the oil should be changed every 3,000 or every 5,000 miles. In church meetings, these make for lively debates and interesting discussions. He says, I'm afraid that over the course of the last 50 years, I've pretty much seen church people fight about everything. Most of the time, it was nothing important at all. In fact, after they get along and they're fighting, they didn't even know how it began. How did this start anyway? I don't know. So, if you've been in many church meetings, you can smile and say, yeah, I guess that sounds familiar. Indeed. Well, let's take a look at these two ladies, and maybe we can learn something about what the Scriptures say. In the book of Philippians and other texts, how do we deal with a lack of peace, a lack of unity between my brother or sister in Christ that I just cannot seem to get along with. I cannot have harmony with this person. What do we do? And I think the scripture gives us some great insight and advice in this. He starts off by saying, My beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy, my crown. He says, In this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. A very tender words. My beloved. Paul was a loving person. They loved him. He loved them. And then he said, whom I long to see, and I thought about this, wow, whom I long to see, what a tender statement. He longed to visit with them. He longed to see them. And I think of these two ladies, and I'm thinking, I'm not too sure they'd say that to one another. You know, it's the fact is there was something between them. As a matter of fact, Paul, in, in verse 8 he says, for, for God is my witness how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus in chapter 1 of Philippians. Verse 8, just imagine that. He says, I long for you with all the affection of Christ. Christ loving me. I long for you that well. <laughs> just say, boy, these two ladies missed out on that somehow, right? There didn't seem to be any loss of love between them. But then he goes on to say, my joy and my crown. What an interesting statement. You're my joy and my crown. Now, we don't hear that say to, said today as often, but it could be. But what did he mean by that? Well, he explains that when he writes to the church at Thessalonica because he said they were his crown of boasting. First Thessalonians 2.19, who is our hope or our joy? He says to the saints at Thessalonica, Who is our hope or our joy or crown of boasting in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it not you? You're my hope. You're my joy. You're my crown of boasting when I come before the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ with you. Wow. <laughs> what a wonderful thing to say. Now, if someone said that to us, it would probably melt right there. You say, man, no one has ever said that to me before. You know, but there was such a love relationship between Paul and the churches. Now, don't get me wrong. At some times, he took the rod. He was ready to discipline as a father was, a loving father. But we see so much of that love there. And you say, wow, what happened to these two ladies? You know, that they just couldn't get along. You know, he tells them, to stand firm in the Lord. And boy, that is the case. Don't we need to, as he writes to this church and other churches, stand firm in the Lord. When he writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, be on the alert. Stand firm 
not in the Lord here, but it is saying in the Lord, stand firm in the faith, that body of truth, the word of God that's been given to you. Stand firm in it. Stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the faith. Be alert, he says. Act like men. We say act like godly women. Be strong. Be strong. Wow. And now he's just ending. 1 Corinthians 16 is ending that book. So he's giving his concluding words. And he wants you to say, hey, listen, I want you to be on the alert for the enemy. You know, we should be on the alert for ourselves as well. What's happening in our spirits, our attitude, be on the alert for not only what's outside coming at us, be on the alert for what's inside, what's happening there. And it seems like these ladies perhaps weren't on the alert as much as they should be because they were letting it happen. Stand firm in the faith and act like men and women of God. Wow. And then in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul uh, gives us some tremendous advice. He gives tremendous advice for the church, really divine advice, inspired of God, infallible, inerrant. He says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Ooh. Boy, I'll tell you, that hits home. Remember, we talked about being citizens of heaven last week. Am I living like a citizen of heaven here on earth? We've got plenty of people living on earth like citizens of hell because of the way they live. There should be a difference in our life. We should be living like citizens of heaven. Here's what he tells the church. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. The way I conduct myself, the way I live my life, is it worthy of the gospel of Christ? And I don't know about you, but that's such a penetrating statement to me. And these ladies needed to ask themselves the question. Hey, this feud we're having between us, you know, between the, what is it, the Hatfields and McCoys? Is that their name? Remember those guys? They couldn't get along, those families? This feud we're having between us, really now, are we living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? And I would like to think they would say, well, no, we're not. We've got to get with it. Get with the program. He goes on to say, so whether I come to see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing in one spirit, in one mind, striving together for the faith. But how is that possible? The first part of that statement tells us, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then you can stand firm together with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, you do wonder how angry these ladies were with one another. You know, and some people get very angry with one another. Like Lucy and Linus in Peanuts. In a Peanuts cartoon, Lucy demands that Linus change a TV channel and then threatens him with her fist if he doesn't. And Linus looks at Lucy and says, What makes you think you have the right to come in here and take over, he said. She said, these five fingers. Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. Ah, well, how did Linus respond? What channel do you want? Then turning away, Linus walked away. He looks at his fingers and says, why can't you get organized like that? The fact is, we don't know if these ladies felt quite that way about one another. But it was pretty heavy stuff. They were going through pretty heavy stuff. So he says in verse 2, I urge Erodia and Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. And I think that's the key. Those last three words to live in harmony, to agree in the Lord. That's where the peace is to be found. Turn to 1 Peter 3, 8 through 11. And I think Peter also gives us some guidance as to how to live in harmony. 
It's one of my favorite sections of Scripture. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 11. As he's summing up, he says, To sum up all of you to be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kindly, and humble in spirit. Verse 8, Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. You are called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Wow. Just there, right that. Just that right there tells us that these gals were off the mark. But then he goes on to say, The one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. As I look at that, I see a key that would have helped these two ladies. First of all, do I want to love life and see good days? Here's the key. Do I want to have harmony with my brother and sister in Christ? Here's the key. Keep my tongue from evil. Now, the least that can be said about these ladies, I think, in safety, is they had a tongue problem. They probably said some pretty nasty things to one another, unpleasant things. They couldn't get along. First of all, keep your tongue from evil. And our tongue is our biggest problem. This little member that we have right here in the hollow. And when we let it loose, it says it's full of deadly poison and no one can tame it but God himself. So first of all, he says, keep your tongue from evil. He says, turn away from evil. Whenever we see potential evil, boy, I'm, I'm I see this is going to be a blowout. I see we're going to have a fight. I see we're going to strongly disagree. I turn away from it. I turn away from it. So I keep my tongue from it. I turn away from it. But I do something better than that, or more than that. Not better, but more. I do good. I do good. I actually do good. What good can I do in this situation? How can I love my sister? How can I love my brother? What good can I do toward them, for them? Yes, certainly we can pray for them. But certainly acts of kindness, as we've talked about. Seeing opportunities to do good. And then finally it says in that section of Scripture, verse 11, seek peace and pursue it. Sometimes we have to really work at peace. It doesn't come easy, does it? We have to seek it out and pursue it for it to happen. So if I want to, according to the Word of God, if I want to desire life, to love it and see good days, I'm going to work at it. And one of the ways I work at it is to keep this little tongue here, this piece of flesh in my mouth, keep it from evil, turn away from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. Now, I didn't get the impression that was happening between these ladies. I didn't get the impression that any of them were peacemakers that they wanted to do good, particularly to one another. Or if they did, they didn't seem to accomplish it. It didn't seem to happen. But instead, they got in lots of trouble with one another. Looking at that verse again, realizing what it means, I urge Erodia and I urge Sintaichi to live in harmony in the Lord. Is there someone that you know as a believer that you are not living in harmony with right now. Someone that you know that you need to really settle the difference with, start doing good, seeking peace, showing the love of Christ, living worthy of the gospel that we're called to live. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Verse 10, Paul speaks to this matter. He speaks to the church at Corinth because it seems there was a little of this everywhere. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be unity among you, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. No divisions, same mind, same judgment. Wow. 
how we need that in our life. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 with me. And the book of Ephesians also gives us great insight as to how uh, we are to deal with a lack of unity between us and other brothers and sisters. This is the practice of believers between one another. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, he says this, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, now to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We'll stop at three. Okay, you notice the great advice we have there. What is God telling us? First of all, the question, am I walking worthy in a manner of my calling? Am I walking worthy in a manner of the gospel of Christ? Am I living like a citizen of heaven, as we've said? That's the first question we have to ask ourselves. You see, the problem, you might say, well, the problem's with her or with him. No, not really. First of all, the problem's with you and God. You say, what do you mean by that? You see, if we were right with God, if we were obeying God, if we were doing what he wants us to do, if we had that vertical relationship in place, one of obedience and yielding to his will, that, then that horizontal relationship would fall into place. So that's where the real heart issue is. So I have to ask my que myself the question, am I walking in a manner worthy of my calling, what I've called to do? Am I showing, number two, verse two, am I showing humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, or am I showing pride and arrogance and willfulness, saying I'm not gonna bow down? And finally, Number three, am I eager? Am I eager? Am I diligent to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace? Remember, it says seek peace and pursue it. You have to work at it. It doesn't come just like that always. Am I eager to maintain unity in the spirit of the bond of peace? There should be no division, no lack of harmony between us and other brothers and sisters in Christ. He writes to the church at Thessalonica in 5.13, he says, Be at peace among yourselves. Turn to James chapter 3, and James gives us some input as well into this. James 3, 17 and 18. As he talks about that wisdom from above and that wisdom from below. 17 and 18, he says, but the wisdom from above. Now, I want you to notice the characteristics of this wisdom from above. And what a difference it would make in our relationship with one another. What a difference it would make to bring harmony and unity with those that we have a hard time with and those that have a hard time with us. It tells us, but this wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. Number one, peaceable. Pure, no alloys in it. Pure motives. Gentle. Wow, okay. There you go. Reasonable. Wow. Willing to reason, willing to talk, not being unreasonable, as we'd say, not being pig-headed, not being stubborn, all right? Reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, full of good things, unwavering without hypocrisy. You say, well, yeah, I could see where those spiritual qualities would really make a difference if I were to apply them in relationships with folks that I have a hard time with, Christian folks. But I realize I have to get straightened out in my relationship with God, applying His truth in my life first. 
What beautiful truth. And it goes on to say, And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. I want to be a peacemaker. I want that harvest of righteousness sown. But by those who make peace. Not war, but those who make peace. Oh, as I think of these two ladies, Eurodia and Santaichi, who weren't living in harmony with one another, but they could in the Lord. That's what Paul said. They could in the Lord. So he asked this true companion to come along and to help them get the focus off themselves and get their focus on the Lord. You see, that's the issue, right? When we focus on one another, I don't like you, this, that about you, we're focusing on one another instead of focusing on the Lord, what he wants us to do. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, I've made it my ambition to be pleasing to me. Does it say that? No. I've made it my ambition to be pleasing to him. That's the problem. When we're pleasing to me, when we're saying like good old Frankie did, I'll do it my way, there's going to be problems. Won't we say, no, there's only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. And when I please self, I get into big problems. But when I please God, problems get straightened out. When I do it His way. Hebrews 13, 1 says, Let love of the brethren continue. Not just for a while, but let it continue. Turn to Mark chapter 9 for a moment. Mark chapter 9. And we're called to be salty Christians. And boy, we need salt in our relationships. We really do. Mark 9.50. If I get that right. Yes, I do, I think. We have to ask ourselves the question, am I a salty Christian? He says, salt is good. But if the salt becomes unsalty, what will, it make, what will make it salty again? You see, as Christians, we should preserve and we should flavor those around us. Because it goes on to say, at the end of that verse, a very interesting statement. It says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. There you go. There seems to be a relationship between having that salt in ourselves and being at peace with one another. That salt being that joy, that light, that commitment to Christ, being that preservative. Apparently, these ladies, I think, started losing their salt. And the fact is, in Christ, we're worth our salt. If we step outside of Christ, we're going to start losing our salt. We've got to walk by the Spirit and not fulfill what comes natural, the desires of the flesh. So he says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Wow. I tell you, Herodias, Sintaichi, get some salt, gals. Come on, get some salt. You're losing your salt. Have salt in yourself. Be at peace with one another. Finally, in verse 3 of our text, he says, Indeed, true companion, I ask you to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. So there they were, side by side, sharing in the cause of the gospel. Paul struggled together with Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are written in the book of life. So there's no question that they were saved. Okay? So we have disagreements with one another. Does they, Oh, you can't be saved. Not necessarily. These ladies were having disagreements and apparently quite strong at times. Look at Philippians chapter 2. And we have some great insight here that Paul tells them. And apparently he addresses... I think the issues of these ladies and other issues by sharing these things beforehand, before he even mentions the problem with these ladies. What does he say in verse 2 and 3? He says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, 
united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness, he says, or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. And then verse 4, do not merely look out for your own interests, personal interests, but also for the interests of others. I think that's the key. I really do think that is the key that would have solved, along with the other truth we've brought together, it would have solved the issue between these two ladies. They weren't of the same mind. They weren't uh, united as they should be. They weren't really having the same love because sin separated them. We're told to watch out for the problem. What was the problem? This verse tells us selfishness, right? Empty conceit gets in the way. Pride gets in the way. What's the solution? He says, humility of mind, humbling ourselves before God and one another, and looking out for the interests of others. Not just me. It's not numero uno, as our culture tells us but rather, you're number one. You concern me. You're important to God, yes, but you're important to me too. And I care about you. I care about you. So we need to humble ourselves, look out for the interests of others as well, and deal with our selfishness, deal with our empty conceit, which causes division among us. Very much so. Wow. Wow. What powerful direction Paul gives them. So what have we said? Well, we've seen two ladies. Two ladies in the church at Philippi who really had a hard time getting along. And we've looked at some truths and principles in the book of Philippi and other scriptures we've brought to bear that could be helpful and I think would be helpful in dealing with it. What do we talk about? Well, we looked at the scriptures from Corinthians 16 to be on the alert. Be on the alert as to what is happening in our own selves. What is happening in our own spirit. Is there any division taking place? Standing firm in the faith we talked about. Acting like men and women of God. How important that is. Being strong in Him. Then Philippians 1.27 we talked about standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You see, self is the big problem. Forget about self, focus on him. A good scripture we didn't look at, but I love it in the Old Testament. It's very beautiful, Psalm 133. What does it say? How good and pleasant it is for brothers, and we'll include sisters as well, to dwell together in unity but how not good it is and how unpleasant it is when we don't dwell together in unity. It can become pretty unpleasant and not very good. We talked about also being salt, right? Salt is good, but have you and I lost our saltiness? Have we lost our flavor in the Lord? It says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. It's great to be a spicy Christian, a Christian with a lot of salt and vim and vigor. And that makes a difference. Some have gone blah. Some have gone flat. We need to get back that salt again. Of course, James told us, hey, listen, if we're going to be united together, we need to live in peace. We need to be peaceable, gentle. We need to be open to reason, reasonable Christians with one another, full of mercy and good fruits. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 4, we said, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And I tell you, those, those kind of passages just are very uplifting. They encourage us, but they're very convicting at the same time. Because we do ask, am I living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? Am I living in a manner worthy of my calling? Am I living as a citizen of heaven? And sometimes... If we're honest, we'd probably say no, no, and again no. But we can. 
living worthy of our calling, and how do we do that with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That eagerness is there. To be diligent to do that requires work. Hey, listen, all of us, Peter says, want to love life and see good days. We all do. You know how to do that? Keep your tongue from evil. Turn away from evil. Do good. Seek peace and pursue it. That will deal effectively. Apparently, these ladies were not doing that. In Philippians 2-3, through we were told, Selfishness is the big enemy. Empty conceit and pride. Solution, humility of mind. Looking out for the interests of others. I want to ask you this morning, is there anyone in your life that you have disunity with, that you lack harmony with, that you're not at peace with, maybe even at war with. We're told if we are citizens of heaven, if we are worthy of our calling and the gospel of Christ, let's deal with it. Let's apply scriptural truth. And that'll mean getting right with God first, simply obeying what he says getting that vertical relationship straightened out, and then we can apply it horizontally. May God help us, indeed, to be true companions, to help others be united, and to deal also with that sin that may be in our own life. You see, that's not going to help us in furthering the gospel of Christ in our lives. We do want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. No Christian after 20 years should say, I still don't like that person. How sad, but often is the case, it seems. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for helping us deal with it, not only in the lives of these ladies as we think about them, but in our own lives. Thank you for so much good direction from the scriptures. Help us now not just to think about it, but to actually live out these truths in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now a song.